I'm going to move us on to slide 17 because I think it's important that uh, we talk about the global issues. That's one of the, the new components of uh, the fraud resistant organization uh, report is that it, it has these global notes in there and actually a chapter on building a global fraud resistant culture. Um, but as we move on, I will remind everybody since you raised it, uh, Rick, about the judgment framework, the CAQ's judgment framework, because there is a, a whole uh, uh, discussion in there about how to avoid the common judgment tendencies and, and, and uh, the psychological aspects of judgment. So, but talking about the, uh, the, the fraud resistant organization from a global perspective, uh, we've got on the slide here the most common uh, compliance risk factors of concern uh, in emerging markets such as Brazil and Russia, India and China. And over two thirds indicated that the acceptance of corrupt business practices of the greatest concern to the uh, respondents. And so Carl, I'm going to start with you because I know as we mentioned earlier, MetLife operates in 50 countries. And so uh, how do you, in such a broad footprint, uh, address the issue of corrupt business practices over so many different cultures? Um, yeah, it is... Um, daunting, uh, I would imagine. What, oh, daunting. daunting. <laughs> it's, it's consistency, right? It, it's actually having global standards and global policies that, are, that, are, that act as a minimum standard locally. Um, and as you enter into uh, countries that have specific um, uh, rules and regulations, that your global standard is adjusted to add in uh, those local. So it's a very consistent uh, program. But to do that also, um, you, you do need to have a pretty solid awareness of what it's like to operate in each of these countries. Um, you know, you may not get your mail delivered in certain countries if you did not facilitate uh, that from, from happening. Um, that sounds really bad because it's a facilitation payment, but actually um, if it's norm in that country and it's documented and it's uh, tracked, um, then that's norm. And I think understanding what is norm and what is not norm and what is bribery versus mail delivery um, is, uh, is very important to understand in, in operating in multiple different countries and always adhering to that global standard, uh, never uh, giving in um, and adjusting that locally so that it can be uh, managed accordingly. So Ken, um, from a audit committee or a board uh, perspective, H how can boards help companies mitigate the risks uh, in these other cultures? Well, we're, we're beginning to see, and uh, it may have come from uh, the Chinese uh, coal company incident, uh, but we're seeing companies proactively in, in order to try to evangelize the right culture, uh, pick a, a U.S. national up and put them in that country, for example. Uh, so that there's some leader there who uh, isn't in the same water. That that leader can say, uh, here's uh, right and here's wrong. Here's, here's the way we look at it. Because sometimes when you're in a different culture, it's very difficult because there's really no real common language. People really actually don't believe what you, we tell them. And it must be some sort of miscommunication. Uh, so. That's one thing we can do. Second thing we can do uh, from a board perspective, we can ask management, what specifically are you doing? Uh, we have concerns there. there. There are companies that will help you figure out which cultures are of the greatest risk because of what things. So they help you focus in on it. Uh, so you could ask the management team, uh, what are you doing? Uh, how's it working out? What kind of results uh, have we seen thus far? What kinds of issues do you think are at higher risk than, than other issues? Uh, so there's those things we can do. There are those audit committee members. Now, there's two sides to this. I'll tell you that right now. One side says audit committees ought to go to these different countries and visit everybody. There's another side that says, look, you know, no audit committee member ever saw a dirty factory floor. 
uh, you know, everybody knows a person's going to show up. They're going to make the police spick and span. What are you actually seeing? You know, I don't really know the answer to that question uh, because it's true. They know you're coming. To, to go there and not have them know you're, that creates another whole uh, kettle of fish. Going back to that trust issue. It right? really does go back to that trust issue. So it has to be uh, the right balance. My personal view is you've you got to really lay this at the feet of management. Management's got to hear that you think it's an issue. Uh, you need to understand what they're doing. And then for Pete's sakes, make sure they got enough resources to do it. Uh, because if they don't have enough resources to do it, it isn't actually going to get done. And obviously, this is a case, Rick, where with the external audit, you can ask external audit when you're looking at the risk characteristics for the upcoming audit, what are you doing in Jabip? Because we've never operated there before. And hopefully, uh, external and internal audit can help us uh, think our way through that. Yeah, this is an area that really differs on the scale of the company. Right. And, and I think Carl and Ken's comments really sort of presuppose a pretty substantial organization that has the ability to drive resources in. The reality is that most, most, most U.S. companies doing business of, abroad are, are smaller. Uh, and and if, you're, if you're a $400 million manufacturer today, you're doing business abroad, some either manufacturing oh, sure. or sa sales offices or what have you. <clears throat> but you may only be doing it in, a, in one or two or three locations. And the challenges uh, are much more basic <clears throat> in that environment. The challenges are, do I even understand the laws of the country? You know, it, are there property rights? You know, is there, is there an effective court system? And, and these, are base, these are very important. So there, you know, over the last half dozen years, there's been a lot of, a lot of discussion about uh, the credibility of financial reporting in China. And in some areas, it's been accepted as very, very good. In some areas, it's been flat out fraudulent. And, and uh, you, for a smaller company, this is a huge issue. Uh, and for uh, internal auditors, external auditors, it's a huge issue. There are, there are countries where uh, if you were to, to, to use the, one of the most basic auditing techniques in the U.S., send a confirmation to a bank, the bank will receive the confirmation, call up the company, and ask what numbers they want filled in. <coughs> and and you know that's you don't have any errors that way. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's it's just that that you have to understand the basics. And there are many many assumptions that we have because we're U.S. centric or or say even even Western democracy centric, where you're used to the rule of law, you're you're used to to credit being good largely, you're used to people's word generally being good, and so forth. And if you don't understand the differences between China and Russia and Western Europe, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So I, I think that, to me, the issue becomes, becomes more of a question of beginning at, the, at a much lower level of basics for the vast majority of companies, which are smaller scale, and making sure you really understand and prepare yourself for what's happening when you're working in those countries. So I know that there are, are countries and cultures where it's, it's frowned upon, if not uh, verboten, <coughs> to uh, question your superior. And uh, Tracy, I know FEI recently opened up a Tokyo or a Japan chapter, and there was actually an event in Tokyo where this was addressed. Share with us some of the learnings from that, you know, how you deal sure. specifically where, because it's not just in Japan, I think, where there's that kind of, you know, you don't question uh, the person above you. So, so much for that professional skepticism. Right. And so, um, <laughs> so with that said, um, you know, it, it is, as you mentioned, it's not embraced in that country culturally. It's looked upon very negatively almost as a uh, challenging of honor if, if you are going to question your superiors. Actually, one of the uh, great case studies that you reference in the fraud resistant organization is the Olympus whistleblower case. I had the opportunity to hear him speak, and I would, anybody who hasn't had a chance and doesn't know all those details, but that is a perfect example of someone who came in into a culture, questioned the board for perhaps some erroneous payments that were being had, and was dismissed accordingly. So um, that is probably the best example of, of a CEO who was completely disempowered by just asking the question to get it correct. Mm -hmm. So that brings us back to courage, I think, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, it does. Um, so, Carl, one last question for you before we move on, and uh, because we, we mentioned mm -hmm. that your whistleblower program is in 50 countries, how do you set up a whistleblower program in countries because of the local laws? I mean, are there impediments there? I know you mentioned consistency, but are there other issues that, that companies can use to, uh, to, will confront, and then tips to overcome those, those tendencies? Yeah, I think there's other forms of, uh, of communication that can also be acceptable as well in terms of uh, uh, emailing or uh, calls to uh, members of, uh, of, of management in country or to myself or to the head of compliance. Um, so there's a number of avenues that are available um, that can be considered when, uh, uh, when there are uh, cultural uh, differences. Okay, let's t turn quickly to slide 18 because we've got some other tips up here uh, with respect to building a uh, fraud-resistant culture in a global context. And we talked about tone at the top. Uh, we talked about the importance of instilling an ethical culture and a code of conduct. And so any last tips with respect to challenges that companies will face when trying to incorporate these types of um, programs within a, a global organization? I just think it's about making sure that the whole constituency globally understands the Foreign Corrupt Practices Acts and all those type of regulatory items so they understand the consequences of actions. Any other thoughts? I think another challenge is uh, employee evaluations. Uh, no, <laughs> employee evaluate, nobody likes them, uh, especially if there's anything negative. And, and in certain cultures, uh, what we think is totally acceptable here is totally unacceptable there, the one that you mentioned, Cindy. Um, that might be upwardly oriented, but still in all, uh, sitting down having a candid discussion with somebody in a different culture, if they're not prepared to hear it, and if you haven't tailored it to the scenario, you could end up with some pretty drastic results. And I happen to think that employee evaluations are one of the most underutilized uh, tools that we have and one of the reasons, by the way, that most employee evaluations are pretty awful. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think we're change, uh, turning to uh, talent, ta t talent management, recognizing how important they are for uh, that management, but I think we're a long way from where we want to be. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to slide 19, and this is something I always like to do, which is uh, ask each of the panelists. We've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, and so I want to go around again, go around the horn again, and ask each one of you to, uh, if you could leave our viewers with just one key point, uh, what would that be? What was your one last thought that you'd like them to know? So Rick, I'm going to suggest, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, I really think that, that in general, fraud risk and anti-fraud efforts just need more conscious agenda time. I think that uh, in the, 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 the limited amount of time that's available in all of the constituencies that we've talked about today, management, internal audit, the boards and audit committees and the external auditor, when those groups get together, we seem to have a fairly limited amount of time. And I find that, that fraud and anti-fraud issues, unless it, there, we are being responsive to an incident, take, gets almost no, no agenda time. And I think it's important that we raise the prominence of, of this issue in the agendas when we're all together, and I think we need to be more diligent about allocating some time in those discussions to the topic in advance of something that we have to be reactive to. Ken, your top takeaway? <clears throat> My top takeaway is um, let's not have a scenario where we have a big bowl of, of, uh, of, of pablum and somewhere in there is a raisin, and it's up to the board and everybody else to find that raisin in one hour. Uh, I think that giving people reports, as to my earlier point, that fill up seven, eight hundred pages is not helpful. Uh, I think that really what we need to do, especially in the compliance-oriented oriented agenda we find ourselves now, we need to make board uh, reports way more actionable. I think we need to make senior management reports way more actionable. Stop looking at all the right data <laughs> and start looking at what the anomalies are. What are the yellow flags? What are the potentials? That way we can focus people's time. Great. Carl? 
Uh, transparency. Uh, transparency and communication. And uh, I'd like to play off Ken. Uh, I'd, I'd be concise in my communication uh, to the board as well. And Tracy, I'm going to give you the final okay, takeaway. Well, thank you. Well, I would say that management definitely needs to take the lead in detecting and deterring fraud. Um, they need to be very proactive in use, utilizing partners in the financial reporting supply chain. And it's very important that the management team uh, you know, keeps that open communication, remember positive tone at the top, uh, uh, keep up to date on regulatory issues, economic issues, things that could impact the financial reporting environment, and, um, and take internal reports seriously. And uh, don't rest on your laurels. Make sure if you see something, say something. Great. Well, that brings us to the end of our webcast. Uh, first of all, I want to thank each one of you for a fantastic webcast. So Ken from the NACD, Carl from MetLife, Tracy from FEI, and Rick from Crow Horwath. Uh, I think it's been a really uh, fantastic webcast and a lot of good material here.